John. We move on now <coughs> to the 12th study presentation here at the British Columbian Camp 1984. This is the 10 o'clock session on the 27th, Monday. <coughs> 27th of August, of course. We wish now to continue our consideration of the great prophecies that relate to our present existence as a movement. So far we've seen two, the two days of opportunity and the more detailed presentation entitled The Two Course of the Marriage or The Wedding Parable of Matthew Chapter 22. As I, as I mentioned rather hastily in closing last night, um, this prophecy is so clear and so convincing it uh, doesn't permit any kind of um, rejection. I have to report that I've never found anyone yet who could really refute it even though, of course, those in the church don't accept it. The commonest argument leveled against it is that um, the marriage was not remade back in 1844, that um, the Great Second Advent movement was simply the servants going to the highways and the hedges to gather in those who are ready for the wedding. But the statements, of course, in the early writings and great controversy make it very plain that the marriage was made back in 1844, and that answers that objection very nicely. I want to move on now to the next uh, prophecy, a rather shorter one, found in the book of Hosea. This will occupy just a few moments as it's quite short, but it's a very important Old Testament reference to the same principle that we've been looking at in the parable of Matthew chapter 22 and also in the study of the two days of opportunity. The reference is Hosea chapter 5, verses, verse 15 and 6 verses 1 to 3. Now our uh, authority for applying this to the last days is found in the scripture itself because it is a prophecy of the coming of the latter rain. You'll note chapter 6 and verse 3 for instance then shall we know that is after certain things have transpired and certain conditions have been met then shall we know if we follow on to know the Lord his going forth is prepared as the morning and he shall come unto us as the rain as the latter and former rain unto the earth now when of course is the only point in history when the latter rain shall fall in the very near future down at the end of time so what is this prophecy all about the end of all things the latter rain which is the last thing to happen upon this earth so let's go back then and look at verses 15 of chapter 5 which really is a part of chapter 6 you understand of course the chapter divisions are the work of translators not the original writers so the verse divisions and verse 15 it says I will go and return to my place till they acknowledge their offence and seek my face in their affliction they will seek me early and inasmuch as we're looking here to lead up to the latter rain and inasmuch as there was a time when the angel of God who came down in mighty power <clears throat> and was rejected did in fact return to his place and remained there until such time as the people of God began to acknowledge their offence and seek his face and in their affliction they be led to seek him early it is not difficult to recognise that this took place back in 1888 when the first call to the marriage was made and it will become even more apparent as we move on to chapter 3 verses 1, 2, 3. Now without question the mighty angel of Revelation 18 which is the third angel of message in Verity did come down in 1888. I'd like to note with you a statement from the Bible Commentary Volume 7 a comment on Revelation chapter 18, 1 to 4 which reads as follows. The page is page 984. The time of test is just upon us for the loud cry of the third angel has already begun in the revelation of the, of the righteousness of Christ, the sin-pardoning Redeemer. This is the beginning of the light of the angel whose glory shall fill the whole earth. Now that mighty angel came down to this earth in 1888. He came down to lighten the earth with his glory but unfortunately he was rejected and when rejected of course he said in effect I will go and return to my place till they acknowledge their offence and seek my face in their affliction they will seek me early now when the 
1888 message was rejected, the Seventh-day Adventist Church continued in a wilderness wandering experience, which of course is very afflicting, very unpleasant, very unsatisfactory. Now as I look back on um, the period leading up to 1915, which I remember reasonably well, many of you folk of course not yet born by that time, some of you were, I remember quite well that there was a, a, uh, an unchallenged confidence in the general conference throughout the entire length and breadth of the Adventist world. If we heard, heard the, uh, the general conference members coming to Australia to preach in our churches, we would travel hundreds of miles just to hear him, and we thought that they were literally gods upon this earth. But down toward the end of the, the 1940s, running up toward 1950, the, there, there, there began to uh, move a, a, a feeling of, of lost confidence in the general conference leaders. Up until that time, there was great confidence that the General Conference men would solve all the church's pressing problems, which were growing worse by the year. But finally, in 1950, that seemed to have been broken, and suddenly, people began to arise with the attitude, well, somebody's got to do something, it better be me. And the old cry, let's do something. We learned about that, of course, in the study of the works program a few years ago, and also in Sabbath Rest. And a lot of little movements began to pop up around the country with a leader who was really an opportunist, a person not knowing the Sabbath West message, appointed himself to be a messenger. And these men usually came along with some peculiar little uh, quirk of their own, while at the same time preaching very rigidly health reform, dress reform and the letter of the law. But at the same time, there came this cry, this call, uh, initiated by Whelan and Short, that we had to acknowledge our offence, recognise the mistake made back in 1888, gather up the message and present it to the people, and live and believe what Wagon and Jones was given to, uh, to give to the people. As the statement says in uh, Hosea chapter 5 and verse 15, uh, I will go and return to my place till they acknowledge their offence and seek my face. In their affliction they will seek me early. We wonder sometimes why it takes so long for the second call to come. But God cannot risk sending the second call until at least there's some kind of favourable situation into which to send it. And sin does have a certain uh, qualification or quality or ability to correct itself. In other words, when the sinner begins to see the effect of his sin upon himself, he'll sometimes back off from the sin and seek a solution to it, at least uh, to a certain extent. I'd like you to go back with me to a text I've been quoting several times, Leviticus 26 and verse 40. Uh, it needs to be very clear in our minds that um, <clears throat> God does in fact require confession for the sins of our fathers. Uh, Leviticus then 26 and verse 14 they note what the word says if they shall confess their iniquity and what else the iniquity of their fathers with their trespass which they trespassed against me and that also they have walked contrary unto me and that I also have walked contrary unto them and have brought them into the land of their enemies if, if then their uncircumcised hearts be humbled and they then accept the pain, or the place of their iniquity, then will I remember my covenant with Jacob, and also my covenant with Isaac, and also my covenant with Abraham will I, will I remember, and I will remember the land. Now, in this passage, God specifies the area in which confession is to be made. He says, if they will confess their iniquity, that iniquity which caused them to walk contrary unto God, then he would hear their prayer and would become once again their God and their leader. Now, if, for instance, your father committed murder or, or was a drinker or a smoker or whatever else he might, he might have been and committed those individual acts of sin, you are not... You, you don't have to confess the, those sins of your fathers, but... When your spiritual forefathers in the church 
have turned aside from God's truth and rejected that truth and has, has brought you up in that same rejection of truth then his sin has become your sin and becomes necessary for you to trace back to the point of deviation to the point where your father's left the pathway of truth because you left the pathway of truth with him you being in his loins before you were born and you must go back to that point make the confession and then begin the recovery now interestingly enough of course uh, Adventist ministers did this with, with Protestant people if they're staying with a Presbyterian or a Lutheran or a Baptist or any other Protestant re religionist they would teach them about the end of the 2300 days teach them of the rejection by the Protestant churches back in 1844 and then call upon those folk to acknowledge that, that rejection and to go back to that point and pick up the thread from where their fathers had let, let, let them down. And that's the principle, of course, involved. And so when the Adventist people back in 1888 refused to heed the warning and receive the call sent to them at that point of time, we have to go back and recognize that mistake, frankly and openly, and and then pick up the message from where it was, it was left off by those who went before us. And that was the call that Will in a short um, pre presented to the, to the Adventist Church. And in response to that call, most of the church, of course, gave a negative reply. But a few of us did acknowledge the offence. Did, we did seek God's face in our affliction. We did seek him early. And chapter 6 verse 1, Hosea chapter 6 verse 1, we now go on to read the cry of the people, Come and let us return unto the Lord, for he is torn and he will heal us. He is smitten and he will bind us up. After two days will he revive us. In the third day we, uh, he will raise us up and we shall live in his sight. Now here we have um, a very interesting text which says, After two days what will he do he will revive us in the third day he will raise us up and we shall live in his sight now if we tie this in as we must do with the parable of Matthew 22 the two, the two prophecies of course are very closely interrelated if you just look at the border moment now we're talking here in terms of the time when the angel went back to heaven as being after the rejection of the first call then there is the acknowledgement and the second call comes through so the first call is the first day and the second call is the second day now let's see what happens in the third day which is the day following the second day which is in effect the day in which we're living right now okay we're now in the third day now in the third day we're told he'll revive us and he will raise us up now if you think back those of you know something of the history of this movement and you'll know more about the course when we relate to you the story in a couple of days time maybe by tomorrow as the case may be um, the struggle that took place between 1950 and 1962 was a very very difficult one and when it was over and the church had made its final decision the, the awakening as many people called it had become a very scattered and, and decimated group of people indeed and only very very few survived the disappointment which came when the church decided not to go on with the message and the majority of the believers went back to the church again to identify with it and they have since been completely lost sight of and so a charge of new life a very definite revival of strength was needed by the little little remnant who were standing true to the principles of this message and while at first it seemed as if the group would fall completely that no one would stand for the truth in the end a turning point was reached and recovery began and the scattering time was followed by the gathering time and it's not difficult to recognize that between 1960 and the present time God has been raising up a movement in this third day as he promised he would and we shall live in his sight now in whose sight alone today are we a living movement does the Adventist Church view us that way? Does the Catholic Church view us that way? Does the world view us that way? None of these, none of these powers upon this earth view us that way, but in whose sight are we a living movement? In God's sight. And that's the only sight which really matters, is it not? 
all the others don't really concern us at all now we are not now at this point of course now we have become a, become a living movement in his sight now that in this third day we have been raised up we are not to become complacent as other movements have before us we are not to rest content with a good beginning we are now to follow on to know the Lord verse 3 then shall we know if we follow on to know the Lord and that of course uh, directs our minds to the fact that we have learned uh, several things during this third day things in which we are now to build more strongly they are namely the, the character of God by which we know him and the Sabbath rest principle by which we know his ways now if we follow on in that knowledge then what is the promise his going forth is prepared as the morning and he shall come unto us as the rain as the latter and former rain unto the earth now you, you shall have no difficulty recognizing that this is the Old Testament version of Matthew 22 the angel comes and goes on the first day in the second day we say come let's return to him but we're scattered and torn and the third day we're raised up and during the third day of the tarrying time if we keep on growing if we keep on following on to know the Lord then there comes to us the unspeakable gift of the latter rain which will bring about the end of God's work that then is the third prophetic outline the little study from Hosea chapter 5 and 6 which will now leave and pass back to Matthew chapter 25 for the fourth outline and this of course is the parable of the ten virgins Matthew chapter 25 verses 1 to about 11 I think hmm <clears throat> Now before I take the um, diagram off the board that we presently have there I wish to make the point that the parable of Matthew 25 doesn't go right back to the beginning of Matthew 22 just as Matthew 22 doesn't go back to the beginning of the two days of opportunity. The Matthew 25 is a more detailed explanation of the second call and the, the events which come after that. Um, I hope we can pull, make a diagram which uh, in the end which will align all these prophecies up one with the other just as you can line up Daniel 2, 7, 8, 9 and 11 on top of each other and while each chapter gives different information it's very evident of course that they're covering the same ground the same four world empires and the same subsequent events let's look briefly now at Matthew 25, 1 to 10 or 11 we know the parable very well but we would pay us to read it I think because the details should be kept very fresh in mind then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom and five of them were wise and five were foolish they that were wise took their, vest, took their lamps and took no oil with them but the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps while the bridegroom tarried they all slumbered and slept and at midnight there was a cry made behold the bridegroom cometh go you out to meet him then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps and the foolish said to the wise give us of your oil for our lamps have gone out but the wise answered saying not so lest there be not enough for us and you but go you rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves and while they went to buy the bridegroom came and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage and the door was shut afterwards came also the other virgins saying Lord Lord open to us but he answered and said verily I say unto you I know you not watch therefore for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the son of man cometh now this parable which is a prophecy and is treated in that way by sister white has uh, first of all an historical fulfillment and secondly contains some very very um, important warnings and therefore very vital counsels for God's people at the present time and that's why Jesus concluded the present taste by saying watch therefore for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh now I'll begin by quoting from memory a statement in the Review and Herald of August 19, 1890 August 19, 1890 I think that's the exact I think that's the exact day I know it's August 1890 I think it's the 19th for sure maybe it's the 12th 
But if you check it, you'll soon find in that general region. And the statement says, the parable of the ten virgins has been and will be fulfilled to the very letter. A very, very interesting statement and a very valuable statement too. In, so in the year 1890, Sister White says, the parable has been fulfilled to the very letter and she says it will be fulfilled to the very letter which places us on very definite advantage ground because by the careful study of how the has been fulfilled the parable what do we know about the will be how it will fulfill the parable so how can we go wrong if we're careful and honest we can't possibly go wrong in the study of the parable of Matthew chapter 25 the question then which arises first is when before 1890 was the first fulfillment carried through are we left to guess at that or do we have positive information <coughs> in the word of God to indicate the exact dates when the first fulfillment took place we do have exact information in the book Great Controversy and um, it begins back on page 390, I believe. No, 393. Be correct, yes, 393. And um, we learn from Great Controversy that the first, the first fulfilment took place between 1831 and 1844. In fact, the great disappointment was that point of time when the bridegroom came to the Ancient of Days and they who were ready went in with him to the marriage and the door was shut. Now my first task there is to establish very plainly that the has been fulfilment prior to 1890 did in fact take place between 1831 and 1844. My first reference is Great Controversy page 393. First of all, Sister White quotes the opening verses of Matthew 25 which we've just read. I'll read them again quickly. She says, or she quotes rather, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them, but the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go you out to meet him. Now having quoted the scripture, Sister White then proceeds to explain how it's to be applied. And here it comes. The coming of Christ as announced by the first angel's message was understood to be represented by the coming of the bridegroom. The widespread reformation under the proclamation of his soon coming answered to the going forth of the virgins. Now note how the two things are put together here it plainly says the widespread reformation under the proclamation of his soon coming which, which was of course the first angel's message answered to the going forth of the virgins so let's put those um, we go back to 18 well, I'll put 1833 that's when the message really got going and as the um, first angel proclaimed his message of the hour of God's judgment has come that answered to the going forth of the virgins both the wise and the foolish expectant of Christ very soon return went forth to meet him now at this point a distinction is made between the wise and the foolish but let's not forget that both the wise and the foolish go forth to meet the bridegroom was there another class who, who, who ignored the message and didn't go forth was there a third class most certainly they were the hypocrites, as they're called in Matthew 24. They were the outright rejectors of the message, those who did not respond in any sense of the word to it, excepting to persecute those who believed and to ridicule them. But for the moment, we're concerned about the wise and the foolish. We now read about them. All had taken their lamps to the Bible, and by its light had gone forth to meet the bridegroom. But while they that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps the latter class now we just had two classes referred to what were they in, in order first of all the foolish and then the wise 
And then it says the latter class, which must refer to which, which, which group? Wise. The wise. The latter class had received the grace of God, the regenerating, enlightening power of the Holy Spirit, which renders his word a lamp to the feet and a light to the path. Now let's pause a moment here before we go any further, because here we have an excellent spirit of prophecy definition of the grace of God. I'll read it again and we'll ask you to tell me what the grace of God therefore is, according to this statement. The latter class had received the grace of God, comma, the regenerating, enlightening power of the Holy Spirit. So what is the grace of God? Right. And what does the word regenerating mean? Life-giving. Right. It means life-giving. Um, it, means, it means the creation of life, actually. I'd like to make an observation here. In We have, of course, uh, the spirit of prophecy in its, in, in its original language. We're very fortunate in that respect. We don't have to uh, worry about whether the translation to hand is accurate or not. And quite frequently, when my translators are quoting Portuguese, German or Norwegian, they will complain that the translation pr produced by the Adventist Church is not accurate, that some rather glaring mistakes are made. And um, in Selected Messages, Volume 1, page 126, we read, A revival and a reformation must take place amongst us. Now all the translations of that statement, especially from the Seminary Adventist Reformed Church, translate the word revival with the German word for awakening. Now you don't, you revive the dead, but you awaken the sleeper. Uh, only, only the dead are revived or given back life again. And the word revival has the meaning of to live again. It comes from two Latin derivations, viva I live and re again. But invariably it's translated over there as awakening and reformation, which of course is a very serious mistranslation. And the word uh, regeneration likewise is a word we, whose meaning can be missed because regeneration and revival mean the same thing and regeneration means, as revival does, a resurrection from spiritual death. It means to live again. It means to be created anew, as Paul says in Ephesians. We are his workmanship, created unto good works. So the regenerating power of the Holy Spirit is creative power. And when a person is possessed of that creative power, he has the power of God, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ, given to take away sin and to place him in the pathway of righteousness. So would you then from that statement expect that a, a wise virgin is a born-again Christian? Right? They had received the grace of God. They received it. They hadn't just heard about it. It was more than just believing in it. They had actually received the grace of God, the regenerating, enlightening power of the Holy Spirit. And if you have received the regenerating power of the Holy Spirit, then the power of God is in you. And as surely as the power of God is in you, then just so certainly you are a newborn Christian because you can't have the power of God and the power of sin at the same time. That's just not possible. So we can, we can therefore rely upon the fact today that a wise version is in fact a born again Christian. In the fear of God, they, that is the wise virgins, had studied the scriptures to learn the truth and had eagerly sought for purity of heart and life. Now I appreciate that sentence which says they had they have studied the scriptures to learn the truth, not to satisfy ambition, not to uh, support preconceived ideas, but to learn what the truth of God actually is. I remember when the message of 1888 was rediscovered, and I read the statement which says that the Lord sent a most precious message to elders Wagner and Jones, and this was the third angel of message in Verity, I said, I said to myself, I want that message. I don't care what it cost me, I want that message. And I didn't rest till I found that message. I searched the scriptures, scriptures to learn the truth. But there are so many people who set out to obtain the message because it's attractive to them. But when they find it's going to cost them friends, reputation, their job, their family, whatever else, then they begin to have second thoughts about it. I'll read further these had a personal experience, a faith in God and his word which could not be overthrown by disappointment and delay. It could not be. 
Now we have the contrasting picture of the foolish virgins, which and we read, others took their lamps and took the oil with them. They had moved from impulse, their fears had been excited by the solemn message, but they had depended upon the faith of their brethren, satisfied with the flickering light of good emotions, without a thorough understanding of the truth and a genuine work of grace in the heart. Now the foolish virgins then do not have a genuine work of grace in the heart. Now let's take that word grace and redefine it. What, is, what does the word grace mean again? Right. The regenerating, enlightening power of the Holy Spirit. So let's rewrite this sentence and take the word grace out and put the divinely inspired definition in. A genuine work of, of, regenerate, of regenerating power in the heart. They didn't have that. So then would you expect a foolish version to be a truly born again Christian? No. Definitely not. These had gone forth to meet the Lord full of hope and the prospect of immediate reward but, when, but they were not prepared for delay and disappointment. When trials came their faith failed and their lights burned dim. The closing chapter in the book Christ Object Lessons is called To Meet the Bridegroom. Now page 412, uh, page 411 rather, we have a statement which describes the experience or lack of experience of the foolish virgins page 411 the class represented by the foolish virgins are not hypocrites they're not hypocrites so therefore they're sincere aren't they now what is a hypocrite a person who professes one thing but does another but the foolish virgins are not hypocrites they do honestly and sincerely go forth to meet the bridegroom now let's see what, what they have and what they don't have now they have a regard for the truth not error, but the truth. They have advocated the truth. They are attracted to those who believe the truth, but they have not yielded themselves to the Holy Spirit's working. They have not fallen upon the rock Christ Jesus and permitted their old nature to be broken up. This class are represented also by the stony ground hearers. They receive the word with readiness, but they fail of assimilating his principles. Its influence is not abiding. The Spirit works upon man's heart according to his desire and consent implanting in him a new nature. But the class represented by the foolish virgins have been content with a superficial work. They do not know God. They have not studied his character. They have not held communion with him. Therefore they do not know how to trust, how to look and live. Their service to God degenerates into a form. And then Sister White quotes the text from Ezekiel chapter 33 uh, uh, that we read the other day about the people saying, let's go and hear, this, hear the prophet. Then they come and listen, but they don't do what the prophet has been called upon to tell them. <clears throat> now I'm, I'm, making, uh, I'm taking care to define a foolish virgin versus a wise virgin because we must recognize that today every person in this room is either a wise or a foolish virgin for instance every one of you has a regard for the truth and both the wise and the foolish have a regard for the truth if you didn't you wouldn't be here would you secondly you've advocated this truth in one way or the other if, if in no other way by, by financial support of it and the wise and the foolish both advocate the truth and every one of you is attracted to those who believe the truth which is true of both the wise and foolish virgins so in appearance how do we all look in appearance the same we all look like wise virgins but have you as yet and this is for you yourself to decide fallen upon the rock Christ Jesus and permitted your old nature to be broken up now this does not this does not simply mean that we have achieved new attitudes, new ideas. It means that the old sinful nature, the offspring of Satan himself, the seed of the devil, which is otherwise called the carnal mind, it's also called the spirit of disobedience, it's called the stony heart, it's called the old man of sin, it's called the leprosy of sin, it is sinfulness, it is what you are in yourself, it is symbolized by the evil tree, and it's a thing well known to us, of course, to this message. Now, if that is still there 
even though suppressed or in, in or even sleeping you are not a wise virgin now very shortly the cry is going to ring out behold the bridegroom cometh go you out to meet him and if you are found when that cry begins still possessed of the old nature then where will you be found when the door is shut outside so knowing the difference between a wise and foolish virgin is very very important very very important indeed at this time in this world's history and in these statements which I have just read of course that difference is made very plainly and very clearly now we move on on page 394 to the next um, step in the program of the development of the foolish of the, I mean of the ten virgins page 394 in the book Great Controversy and we move on now to the next development which was the tarrying time the, the scripture says while the bridegroom tarried they all stumbled and slept and the tarrying time began March 1844 some six months before the great disappointment and uh, Sister Wyatt now quotes the text while the bridegroom tarried they all slumbered and slept and having made the quotation she now explains how this thing came to pass now my real presentation of this parable will follow this all I'm doing now is, is making sure we know when that first fulfillment took place by reading these appropriate statements from the great controversy and then we'll move into a detailed study of it which will be the real study this is just introduction so far <clears throat> by the tearing of the bridegroom is represented the passing of the time when the law was expected the disappointment and the seeming delay now March 1844 is when the law was first expected when that time passed they entered into the tarrying time in this time of uncertainty the interest of the superficial and half-hearted soon began to waver and their efforts to relax but those whose faith was based on the personal knowledge of the Bible had a rock beneath their feet which the waves of disappointment could not wash away next several pages are devoted to discussing the evidences proving that um, the 2300 days would end October 22, 1844 on page 400 we're brought down to the end of the tarrying time and Sister Wise uses these words in the parable of Matthew 25 the time of waiting and slumber is followed by the coming of the bridegroom this was in accordance with the arguments just presented both from prophecy and from the types they carried strong conviction of their truthfulness and the midnight cry was heralded by thousands of believers now as you know of course the virgins sleep during the tarrying time I just put TT for tarrying time and the virgins sleep during that period and then at midnight comes this cry and that was August 1844 and then came of course the short two and a half months during which the midnight cry went forward bring us down to October 22 1844 when the door was shut and the wise virgins were taken in but the foolish were taken out now let's spend a moment um, recalling what took place when the midnight cry began to demonstrate how the prophecy was fulfilled to the very letter and in the parable we have the virgin sleeping as the midnight hour approaches and then suddenly this cry rings out and without any warning whatsoever of its, of its, uh, of its coming the virgins jump to their feet wide awake and go forth to meet the bridegroom in August 1844 at the end of six months of uncertainty the, many believers met at a camp meeting in Exeter, Maine which is uh, out on the eastern coast of the United States of America it was a hot summer and the believers came together expecting some new light to solve their perplexity but several days passed and no new light was coming through at all and on this particular afternoon I think it was about Tuesday or Wednesday I'm not sure the exact day of the week Joseph Bates was the preacher and he was rehearsing to the, to the believers the evidences which had, which proved that they had they had been correct up until that point but they'd all heard these things before they could have told him what he was telling them and with the hot sun beating down on, on this large tent or marquee most of the folk actually nodded off to sleep so the virgins were really slumbering that day in in, in the physical sense as well as the spiritual sense 
And poor Joseph Bates was laboring on trying to put a little life that was only sleep and death. When a horseman rode onto the campground, whose name was Samuel Snow, and this man had been studying very deeply into the prophecy and was quite convinced that October 22 was the day when the Lord would return. He, he tied up his horse and walked across to the big tent and saw his sister, a Mrs. John Coote, sitting right on the outer edge of the, um, of the assembly. So he went and sat down beside her and took out a piece of paper in his Bible and began in whispered tones to relate to her the arguments supportive of the October 22 date. And as the sister listened, she was electrified by what she heard. The Spirit of God took the words of Samuel Snow to her mind and heart with great force and power. And she was so moved by what she heard that she jumped to her feet without even thinking and called out in a loud, strong voice to the preacher, Sir, we have no more time to listen to these truths which have been meet to us in due season. Here is a man with a message, let him speak. Can't you imagine the, the head snapping up and people coming awake? It was an electrifying moment in history, believe you me, and Joseph Bates sat down and said, let him come. And so John, I mean, uh, Samuel Snow walked up to the front, took over the pulpit, and in quiet, measured, authoritative tones laid out the evidence of supporting the October 22 date. And, and the, uh, the message was given in the power of the Holy Spirit. Every person was convicted. They went forth in that, that tent meeting in every direction. And for the next two and a half months, tremendous spiritual energy pervaded the, the people of God. And 50,000 people came in in two and a half months. 50,000 in two and a half months. Now, I've been working hard for 20, 22 or 23 years and can't number 1,000 yet. <laughs> so that, that's a tremendous inflow of people, to say the least of it. And the midnight cry swept like a tidal wave over the land. And that emphasizes, of course, the point that the parable was, in fact, fulfilled to the very letter and will again be fulfilled in like manner to the very letter. And I expect that at one of our camp meetings, sometime in the very near future, God will send us a message we've never heard of or from before. And this man will present to us a message. I don't, I don't know what it will be, of course. None of us knows that as yet. But when it comes, it'll trigger off the outpouring of the latter rain and begin the loud cry. It can happen at any minute. We don't know how soon or how long yet we'll have to wait for it. But when it comes, it'll come suddenly, unexpectedly, and it behoves every believer to ensure before that time comes that he is truly a born-again Christian, a truly a wise virgin, not a foolish one. Otherwise, we should be found without the oil of God's grace in our lamps. Now, this has been an introduction to this to this study. Next next study period, we'll get right down to the business of looking at the ten virgins, the most interesting and commanding part of it. My time is now gone, so I'll stop at that point.